I'm Dr. Lewis Myers. Welcome to Healthcare Today, where we're going to be talking with Ms. Jessa Barnard, who is the Executive Director of the Vermont Medical Society. Ms. Barnard graduated from Dartmouth uh, as an undergraduate with a major in anthropology and a minor in neuroscience. She went on to graduate from law school at Stanford University. She worked over at the Maine Medical Society for some years and since 2017 has been the executive director of the Vermont Medical Society. She also has experience in working with legal aid and disability rights advocates. We're going to talk with her today about some of the really important issues that her organization has been lobbying for in Montpelier this year. Ms. Barner, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So why don't we start by talking a little bit about the Vermont Medical Society. What is that? Who do you represent? Great. So pretty much every state in the country has a state medical society. We are the representatives of physicians and also physician assistants here in the state of Vermont. So we provide education to our members, um, a newsletter, educational resources, and then we spend a lot of our time advocating in Montpelier on bills that impact health care. Some may be kind of the more traditional issues you'd think of physicians working on around licensure or reimbursement, but a lot of our issues are around public health, access to health care, improving um, public health for Vermonters. We're going to talk about some of these specific issues, but you, had, you have such a broad umbrella or, or uh, number of physicians around the state, some of whom may have different kind of political views. How do you decide how to where you're going to stand on an issue, the organization? Yeah, that's a great question. So we have about, as you said, 2,400 members that cross the spectrum from specialty care to uh, primary care. They work in all different employment settings from independent practice to hospital employed to FQHC. So we do spend a lot of time trying to make sure that the positions we take represent kind of the majority view of our members. We have a resolution process. So if it's an issue we don't have a position on already, we set new positions based on um, resolutions that come from any member or group of members or committee and then they go out for comment to our full membership with a member survey and then our board um, which represents uh, kind of different geographic areas different specialties takes all of those comments and the input from the member who brought the resolution and sets a position for the organization well it sounds like a very complex process until you get to the point where you do have it, take a position there were a number of really important bills before the legislature, some of which have been decided and voted on now, some of which I understand are still pending. Let's talk briefly about some of them. Um, shield laws. What Tell us about the shield laws and, and where does that stand? So there are two bills that were taken up this session. One started in the House, one started in the, in the Senate that both have components um, to protect either providers of or patients who were seeking what might be um, more laws that have been or, or care that has been criminalized or stigmatized in other parts of the country. So reproductive health care services, abortion, contraceptive care, and also gender affirming care for those who are transgender. And we know from just all reading the newspaper that some states have made these services really hard to get and in fact have put criminal penalties or even criminal um, sanctions like prison time on um, either those who provide it or, or seek that care. So these were two bills to try to protect those who um, are in Vermont seeking the care or Vermont health care providers who are providing the care to patients. Now, as we know, this is probably the most controversial, hottest topic in our country today across the country and within various states. Getting back to what we were talking about just a minute ago, how did you come forward with a policy and something this hot, as it were? You know, we've taken a position on um, protecting evidence-based health care, including abortion or contraceptive care, a couple of years ago. So when there were, when Vermont, the Vermont legislature was first considering whether to put protections in Vermont law or the Vermont Constitution for um, abortion care and other reproductive health care services. So we kind of went through the process of taking that position a couple of years ago. And since this law is really just um, protecting access to that care that we've already had a policy to, to um, support access to. Uh, we didn't necessarily take a, a new position, though actually we did, um, uh, about a year ago now, we did actually take a position to 
um, support shield laws, but the sort of underlying debate around access to these services was something that our members went through a couple of years ago. Um, and also we had a policy that we had set a couple, uh, supported a, around access to transgender care. I mean, our, our view is really that any patient um, should have access to evidence-based health care. Both of these laws kind of mirror um, the evidence-based guidelines that national organizations like. What are the guidelines for transgender care now in this state? I'm obviously, I'm not a clinician, um, so in no, terms no, of the I mean, clinical care. in terms care, of the legislation. The le so the legislation, we don't have any laws in Vermont that uh, limit or, or prohibit any access to transgender care. It really defers to, um, it would be up to, say, the Board of Medical Practice or other regulatory entities to decide that somebody's not following the, the clinical guidelines, but really it's about best clinical care. Um, so we are, we consider ourselves, um, our members are, are lucky to live in a state where the laws and the medical board and nursing board and other professional boards follow, you know, really allow and support um, clinicians following evidence-based guidelines that are set by, say, national specialty societies or entities. Uh, on comparing that to some other states that have actually um, said that, sort of said that providing certain kinds of care is against what they allow in their state, even if clinically, clinical guidelines say this is the care that should be provided. So this has passed and the governor signed it. Correct, these are both in, in statute now, H89 and S37, and they have protections for things like um, saying if you are disciplined in another state for providing care, um, but it is evidence-based in, and we in Vermont consider this evidence-based care, the Vermont disciplinary boards won't take automatic action based on action taken from another state. Or if you are facing criminal um, sanctions in another state, we, we will only recognize those when we have to for constitutional reasons. So we're trying to protect providers who may, um, who may face penalties from other states where care is criminalized from having that kind of follow them into Vermont. A second issue that came up uh, is addressing violence against health care workers. Um, and we may actually do a separate show on this uh, in the near future. But why was this important now? Is there more violence occurring against health care workers? There seems to be, yes. Um, whether it's partly related to the stress of the pandemic or the kind of decreased kind of social mores and feeling like we can take out our anger on other people. Um, healthcare workers are, are facing violence on a frequent basis, especially in emergency departments and settings like that where patients are under such, and it's not only from the patients, it may be from family members or others who have accompanied the patient to care, feeling like if they're not getting what they ask for or not getting the care as quickly as they want, they may lash out, they may use, you know, hit people, throw things. Um, and there was so some very graphic testimony from some healthcare workers I know who have been injured. Yes. Um, what does the new, new law say? The bill would, or the law would permit um, arrest without a warrant for this threatening or violent behavior um, in, uh, the bill was narrowed throughout the process um, at this point to um, hospitals and EMS personnel. Originally it started as any healthcare worker kind of in any setting. Um, and so basically it would allow police, if the person's been stabilized and there was a lot of concern around, well, what if the person's still experiencing a medical emergency? So that is very clear in the law that you have to make sure that their sort of emergency health situation has been stabilized. Then the, um, the police can remove them from the premises without a, a warrant. Um, so and arrest them. Oh, and arrest them and, and, right, remove them from that situation. Yeah. I know it's been a frust I know from my own experience working in the emergency departments, it's been a frustrating situation in the past because the police hands were often tied, even when people had been injured or, uh, you know, on the premises or hurt or being threatened. So, yeah, it does seem like this is a, a, a logical step forward. I know the airlines have also been experiencing something similar for flight attendants and, and whatnot. Um, suicide prevention, and I think this is one of the ones where we're still waiting. Uh, yes. But tell us about the suicide prevention bill. Um, Vermont, unfortunately, has a fairly high um, suicide rate um, uh, and number of deaths by suicide. And we know that one of the most 
fatal or successful means of um, suicide is with a firearm. Vermont also has a high rate of, of death by suicide using firearms. Um, we've had, there was very eloquent testimony by one of our members who's a um, pediatric intensivist, so works with the sickest kids who are in the ICU, um, about how most people who um, attempt suicide but don't complete it, don't go on to attempt suicide again. And so if you can catch somebody in that moment and intervene and um, get them support, most people go on to not want to, to end their life and to be grateful that they, they did not. If you use a firearm, it is much more likely to be successful and to not have that opportunity to get the person help. And so um, this bill would require a 72-hour waiting period for the purchase of any firearm, which is really an important, considered sort of a cooling off period, that you may have a really impulsive um, need or, or de desire to get this firearm to try to end your life. But if you have that sort of enforced pause, um, it is less likely that that will happen. Now, we already have a red flag laws. We know several years ago, uh, Governor Scott took the stance that this was important. and. Uh, but this is an addition now. This is this for anyone buying a firearm. Right. This is right. The red flag law is sort of after somebody already possesses a firearm, but you have a concern. You think they might use it to harm themselves or others. That's a way to remove the weapon from them. This is to have a, a pause before they. So where is the opposition firearm. to this bill coming from? Well, um, from the you know there there um, honestly is a is a lot of discussion right now on what re level of regulation of firearms is constitutional. The the U.S. Supreme Court has put a lot of that into question with some recent decisions that any restriction on firearm possession has to be sort of rooted in history as opposed to, uh, you know, and, and going back, um, frankly, centuries. Of, um, so it's much, it's a little more complicated to d determine if something's going to hold up to constitutional scrutiny. So that's been one critique. Um, and the other is from those who, you know, don't think there should be restrictions on anyone possessing a, a firearm. Um, we, and we don't know, as you mentioned, this is one that we're waiting on. The governor has five days after a bill um, sort of lands on his desk to either sign it or let it go into law without his signature or veto it. So today is the fifth day, the day that we are recording this, by the time people will be listening to it, we'll know whether he has um, allowed it to go into law Good or veto it. Law end up if if he signs it, could we end up in the Supreme Court, or has it already been? It is possible it could be challenged. Yeah. Yes, um, I believe that we have indicate you know that if it's passed and goes into law, the Attorney General would would then defend it as a, as one of Vermont's laws, but that it could be challenged in in court. Right. Well, that we will know hopefully later today. Correct. Um, yep. And the and the Vermont Medical Society is in support of this. We are in support of it going yes being enacted. Right for the reasons you talked about, saving lives. Correct. Let's talk about another life-saving uh, intervention, which is uh, access to opioid treatment. As we know, this is just a horrible problem, ongoing, get, seems to, if anything, be getting worse after we had made some progress leading up to the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, so there's a bills about expanding access to opiate treatment and harm reduction. Yes, and talk, actually, talk we, the governor just signed this a bill a couple days ago with a very supportive statement. This is S-222, and um, one of the, the sort of big pieces of this bill is um, allocating the funds that have come into our state with a huge multi-state uh, settlement with the, some of the opioid manufacturers. So Vermont will be getting several million dollars a year for the um, next at least 10 years, I believe, to help address opiate addiction. and. Um, there was a committee set up. The, the legislature last year set up kind of a process for prioritizing how those funds will be used. So there was a committee that the Department of Health brought together over the past um, six months or so to come up with kind of a list of priorities for how to use that funding. And then this is the bill that actually allocates it. So there will be more funding going to things like more hub locations around the state to make sure it's more equitably distributed. Uh, they are, this bill actually authorizes drug testing at some of the um, harm reduction sites. So if somebody, you know, one of the real reasons we're seeing so many more fatalities is some of the really high potency synthetic opiates that people don't even know they're getting mixed into their drugs. And so this would actually allow somebody to bring their drugs for testing before they decide to use it or not. Um, it would uh, distribute more Narcan, more naloxone overdose um, reversal medication. 
and a number of other um, sort of components to increase access Narcan to care. Narcan is will soon is or will soon be over the counter. Correct. Uh, one issue has been its cost, yes. um, so this might help defray that cost. Now, when you talk about testing the drugs legally, being able to bring a, someone bring their drugs into test, that is leads me to my next question, and I did talk with Dr. Levine in our first show in this series about harm reduction centers where people could actually uh, use the drugs they brought in under some supervised setting, um, and that's really controversial, but does the Vermont Medical Society at this point have any we did. We actually took a we took a position a couple of months ago on that issue, knowing that the issue would be coming up in the legislature, and that there have been bills on this in the past years. Our board did adopt the statement in support of a harm reduction center, though um, recognizing that resources are limited and that this may have limited geographic impact. That we prioritize other harm reduction strategies be, uh, before. Um, we've put a lot of resources into a harm reduction site. You know, I think they will be difficult. The logistics are the difficult part. You know, make, keeping it staffed. Um, make, how do you? How do people from around the state access it? Um, There's also some political consequences. Many people might not want it in their neighborhood. And where would it be sited? Yes, exactly. There, I think there will be hurdles. There would be hurdles to overcome if one was to to move forward. Um, but we uh, we would support that as a, a component of options available. Um, let's move on to cannabis, which sure. is, um, you know, uh, it has been a process in the last several years as Vermont has moved step by step first to decriminalizing cannabis, then legalizing it, and uh, now trying to set up commercial markets. Um, I know that uh, there's also been uh, some movement toward loosening the regulations even further, and Vermont Medical Society has taken a very strong position on this. Tell, tell us about that. I think you summarized it well. There, obviously, retail sales are here, but our position is has always been and continues to be that public health also needs to be protected. And so, the two issues we that have been sort of highest on our priority list right now are around advertising and potency. So, when the regulations first passed and when the retail sales started, there is, there has been a potency cap on both co solid concentrates, higher concentrate products, and um, cannabis flower. And then there's also been a fairly significant advertising restrictions, and there has been pushback on both of those components to loosen those, and we don't feel like now is the time. I mean, sales are certainly on target. They're meeting all the expectations from kind of a commercial standpoint of what the state would be bringing in for tax revenue, and we know especially high-potency products have do have health impacts. I think there's, in, in Vermont in particular, kind of a low perception of harm from cannabis, that it's safe, it's natural. But some of these products are not at all like what the type of cannabis people were using 10, 20, 30 years ago. It's, it's extremely high potency, and those are the products where people can end up in the emergency room, end up even with, um, we do know there are real mental health um, impacts of using these those specific types of products. We've certainly seen it in, in our hospital and other places. One of the issues, of course, is that with cannabis, there is a large and established black market, uh, and that if the state is going to tax uh, legal cannabis uh, in order to try not to encourage massive use of the drug and also to bring in revenues, that they will ta the price of that legal cannabis will so be so much higher than the black market that people will just stay with the black market. That's happened in New York City and other places. How do, uh, how do we deal with that? Honestly, I don't know that we're going to be able to solve that problem. California, for example, still, as you mentioned, has, still has a lot of black market sales. You know, Vermont, especially because we allowed um, grow your own cannabis several years ago, uh, probably will there will always be cannabis available and products available on the black market. I think it's the reality of the market. I but I don't think that's a reason or, or a valid argument in our view to say, well, those products that we are selling in the regulated market. Um, should be a free-for-all. We should allow anything of any potency or any type of product because otherwise they'll get it on the black market. To us, it's, you know, once the state has kind of put their seal of approval on something and they're saying this is regulated, we have said this is meeting our requirements, that that means it should be at least um, as minimally harmful as possible. Now, you're lobbying, working hard and to, to maintain these um, what seem to be healthy limits. Um, in terms of the cannabis lobby itself, 
uh, big money? Um, I am assuming it is getting to the point of big money, yes. I mean, and, and interestingly, um, you know, on some of these issues, we also ha uh, don't see eye to eye with the Cannabis Control Board. So that's the, that's the regulatory body charged with setting up our market in Vermont. Um, they have been fairly supportive of the advertising restrictions, but they have actually been one of the strongest voices for eliminating the caps on THC potency. So it's it, some of it is from the you know retail market and where there is you know there is more more money over time to lobby on issues, but it's also from the regulators themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to probably do a separate show on that as well. Um, let me ask you about the uh, I think it's called Right to Die. Yes. Uh, which is Vermont was one of the, if not the first state in the country to allow people to choose the time that they wish to die and, and, uh, and to allow physicians to assist in that. Um, now Vermont recently also passed a bill uh, which will allow people from outside the state to come to Vermont. There's some concern that there could be a tourist, if you will, tourist dying industry. Um, what are, what are your thoughts on that? What is the Medical Society's thoughts on that? Because I know physicians have very mixed feelings about this. They, they do, and our members have had mixed feelings on this for, for issue for years. We have a fairly neutral policy that we adopted in, I got my year right, I think it was 2017, on aid in dying as a, as a topic. Um, and so we, as an organization, were neutral on the bill um, that passed this session. It was fairly modest changes to the law. So some other, you know, for one of, in one instance, allowing some um, consults by telehealth. Uh, and then, as you mentioned, the other pieces are allowing non-residents to be able to access the law. I was actually just on an educational webinar about it, and I think the given the number of other hurdles that need to be met to, before you can qualify and the fact that they are giving um, very strong advice that the patient be located in Vermont for all aspects of mm -hmm. taking advantage of the law um, because other states that don't have similar legislation may not, um, you know, it may be considered a, um, a suicide or other, you know, sort of non-endorsed um, action that could lead to consequences for the patient or their family. I don't foresee at this point a, a huge influx from out of state of those who are even able to take advantage of the law. Yeah, the consult by health is a little concerning to me. I mean, we, we remember uh, Senator Frisk, who was a cardiothoracic surgeon many years ago, got some trouble because he sort of diagnosed from afar a young woman who was on, in a terminal condition following a long-term coma. Um, so I, I do have some concern about people making these, some of these decisions or consultations, li truly life and death decisions um, by, by telehealth, but maybe we'll have a separate show on that as well. It is a whole, yes, I'm sure you could have a, certainly fill a half an hour on it. I believe, I could be wrong on this, that it's only one of the two, you know, you have to consult two different yeah. physicians, and I believe it's only one of them that can be by telehealth, but um, I would have to confirm that. Finally, a couple more issues in the time we have remaining. Let's talk about gambling. Many states around the country have um, have perhaps rushed to uh, legalize state gambling, uh, you know, uh, eager to get some of the revenues involved. Um, I think Vermont has not yet, or? I know there was a bill under discussion this session around um, sports betting, yeah. and I actually, that is a good question. I don't know the outcome of that. It is actually not a bill we took a position on, though certainly, um, like any other addictive um, action, um, it's, it, it is, I think it's the same, it's a very similar question around cannabis. Do you, you um, prohibit something or do you legalize it and then, at least in theory, put some of the funding into prevention? Some of the guardrails, for example, guardrails we've seen in some states, um, the big gambling companies are now uh, advertising directly to college students right. who are, tend to be more vulnerable in terms of developing gambling and, and whatnot. So we'll, we'll see how that uh, develops in Vermont. Um, finally, the last issue I want to talk to you about is, is scope of practice. Um, pharmacists, I understand, have been lobbying to prescribe certain medications. Um, psychologists have long been lobbying to prescribe certain psychotropic medications, and I think those are on hold or under study, and at least until next session. Um, you do represent not only physicians, as you mentioned, but physician assistants. And I wonder if you could talk about the physician assistants, what their training is and how they 
slot into our continuum of care here in Vermont. Um, the other, they're generally described as mid-level practitioners, but the other mid-levels are the nurse practitioners here in Vermont. And I know that there have been um, situations where um, nurse practitioners have been able to apply for jobs where physician assistants have been completely ruled out in terms of even being allowed to apply. So yeah. what, what is, where is the Vermont Medical Society stand on this? So a few years ago, we worked with, there's, and there, there's also, I should say, an association for PAs separately, so the Physician Assistant yeah. Association of Vermont, PAAV, and we worked um, closely with them a few years ago to modernize statutes around physician assistant regulation because that was a concern that we had heard um, that because in, in Vermont, at least, after an initial uh, two-year collaborative practice requirement, nurse practitioners, advanced practice nurse practitioners, um, practice independently. They don't need a relationship with a, a physician. Um, PAs at the time needed a supervising physician, at least one. Um, and that was seen as a, a barrier or challenge sometimes to finding employment. Um, and so Vermont did go through a process. The statute changed, the Board of Medical Practice rules changed. So um, physician assistants now need a um, collaborative relationship with a physician, but uh, it's a little different than what the old supervisory model was. Um, we supported that change, working with, we had a group of our members who worked with um, the PAs to sort of say, you know, what, the way we approach any change in scope of practice from any a practitioner um, is uh, we consult with our members and we get their feedback on do they believe that they have the education and training to provide this care safely. And there are instances where we've worked really collaboratively with other professions, the, with the PAs is one example, with the um, pharmacists. Pharmacists actually now have limiting, limited uh, kind of prescribing authority in Vermont for things like um, emergency contraception or um, ex short-term extensions of prescriptions. So our members gave us feedback on that and we thought those were sort of reasonable um, changes to, to certain professional scope. If there's an issue where we think something would not be safe or the best outcome for patients, then we will try to you know, work with that profession or the legislature to, um, to not have that change. I guess, and, and you don't represent the nurses, of course, but now the nurse uh, organizations oversee the nurse practitioners, so they're not uh, overseen by the Board of Medical That's practice. right. In Vermont, there's sort of two pathways for health professionals to be licensed. Uh, MDs and PAs and a couple other professionals are under the Board of Medical Practice, which is through the Department of Health. Then the Office of Professional Regulation, which is in the Secretary of State's office, licenses most other health professionals, nurses, pharmacists. Well, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Um, if the nurse, nursing uh, industry here, educational industry here in Vermont, is overseeing nurse practitioners, do they have the same guardrails, if you will, in terms of looking at the scope of practice that, for example, the physicians and the uh, board of and your organization has in overseeing the physician assistants. It's a fairly similar structure. So even though they're under different sort of oversights um, located in different agencies, they both have boards of uh, a mix of professionals and uh, public actually who hear cases cases of administrative of complaints. So any patient or any individual anywhere in the state can file a complaint with any health provider under their correct board and they have to investigate that complaint, hear it. Um, you know, I don't think I can speak to in individual cases yeah, with those two yeah. boards come out the same, but the, the structure is very, is very similar. And we've had a really actually quite good collaborative relationship with the Office of Professional Regulation. They now um, passed a statute a few years ago that any change of scope of practice needs to go through what they call a sunrise review, which is actually a fairly thorough um, process of studying what is a professional's training and background and um, oversight. Do they think they have the education or training to provide services? And that the goal of that process is to avoid making these disagreements uh, so political and decided in the legislative arena where often legislators don't have the level of background and what right. the differences are between different professionals. So this that process is actually 
I think, been a big improvement for having these conversations. Well, we'll look at, and again, another issue we'll look at in more depth, but I appreciate your input on all of these issues. Um, you have a full, full slate of things that you have to be we dealing keep busy. with. <laughs> um, so get back to it, and uh, thank you again for being with us. Thanks for it's having Jessica me. Barnard. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.